A lot of what we find in uh, traumatic brain injury stroke is the uh, increase in noise. So there's this, uh, an increase in uh, signal to noise ratio. So if you can reduce the noise part, and that's what flow can do, is really switch off, uh, we call it the Woody Allen part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. That part is like, you're not good enough, you can't do it, you're gonna die today, um, all those kind of things. If you can switch that off, your, your, your brain has more processing power. It's basically like unplugging some of the unnecessary le electricity. And so your brain can then work on uh, not having to work on the damaged part of the brain, you can actually work around it. So you can sort of bypass that. Interesting. And that's why I was really interested in flow. One of the big reasons I got into it, uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Kotler um, talked about in his book, uh, The Rise of Superman, which is all about these super athletes, about um, he had Lyme disease, and he's a writer for New York Times and big publications, and he had uh, severe uh, 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 cognitive problems, and uh, he was gonna end his life. He couldn't make any money. His editors were basically saying, this is not good, you're not, your, your sentences don't make any sense, you're not gonna get paid. And he was gonna end his life, and some of his friends uh, took him uh, surfing in LA, and he's like, this is crazy, why are you taking me surfing? I wanna die. And they put him on a surfboard, and even for a mystical second or two, he had this ecstasis or flow experience. He's like, what is this? And he's a very scientific person. He's like, I don't believe in weird stuff. This is, I need to figure this out. And long story short, they kept him going back. And uh, I met him about two, three years ago, and he's, as far as I can tell, unbelievably well. He was flourishing. Hey, my friend, welcome back. It's Mike Maltzow here with HighIntensityHealth.com. As always, I'm excited that you're here. This is part two with Dr. Jan Venter. If you've been subscribing to our channel for a while, you know way back in 2016, he was on the show. And we talked all about flow states. We talked about the ketogenic diet. We talked about neurofeedback and brain-based therapies, particularly how ketones affect cognition. It's an awesome discussion. I'll put the links below. And today we talk, take a deep dive into flow and a little bit more on the practical side, how to get into a flow state, what's needed, and how flow states can improve cognition and brain function. It's a really fun show, it's an awesome discussion. It was actually recorded live in Vancouver, BC. Uh, for those of you that were there, I'm grateful that you, were, that you were a part of it. And today's show is brought to you by our very own Myoscience Nutrition, tools to help you optimize your physical and mental performance while prioritizing long-term health. And one of the natural compounds we're gonna talk about today is omega-3 fats that is EPA and DHA, and how they can be utilized to optimize brain health and the healthy immune response, among other health-promoting properties in the body, due to their ability to convert to pro-resolvin mediators. I know that's probably a new word for you, but there's a lot of research emerging about this. So I'm gonna put the research below there and also links to the Monosorb 1300, which is an omega-3 fat delivered in a monoglyceride form in an enteric coated capsule so it's better absorbed. So all the information is below. We're gonna talk a little bit more about it in this video. And as always, I'm super grateful that you're here. So let's dive back into it with Dr. Jan. Part of the impetus and conversations was um, this, this great book, Stealing Fire, Dr. Jan Venter uh, sent it to me and about flow states. And I started, to think, started thinking that um, you know some people really stick to their exercise program, whether it's yoga, whether it's CrossFit, hiking, um, action sports and, and it becomes a lifelong hobby and they don't need to to muster up the motivation to, to get to the gym they just go after it and I started to think that possibly flow states could be the missing link between exercise compliance and making it you know versus uh, kind of this ebb and flow where people maybe every January they they get on a bandwagon they don't get a flow state possibly so they're not really into that type of exercise and then they, they don't make it a habit so I wanted to, to kind of drill down that with Dr. John Venter, and then we're gonna have a panel discussion uh, all about exercise when it comes to clinical practice, talk about some different components when it comes to time-restricted feeding, the ketogenic diet, which is very, who obviously who here uh, knows about it, pretty much everyone, who here implements some aspect of time-restricted feeding, ketogenic diet, a lot of you. We're gonna learn very shortly too about how the ketogenic diet affects the brain, which I think is really, really exciting uh, stuff. Uh, and then we're going to talk, uh, get some perspective um, when it comes to um, building muscle for hypertrophy and for hormone balance and, and from a physician perspective, physician athlete perspective. 
So, Dr. Jan Venter, why don't you come on up here and be the first victim? Just kidding. <laughs> first guest. So, uh, Dr. Jan and I, about a year ago, did a podcast. This is going to be like part two of that discussion. Did anyone see that by chance? Yeah, it was all, we, we talked about some different, um, uh, so we did a podcast. We talked all about flow, and we talked about uh, the ketogenic diet and how it affects cognition and the brain function. And um, I thought that was really fascinating. And, and so since then, I've been studying flow states uh, and the connection between um, ketones and beta-hydroxybutyrate and how that affects uh, neuroplasticity and cognition. So maybe we can kick it off there with what you've noticed because you're actually objectively looking uh, at cognitive function in your, in your practice using neurofeedback. So maybe let's introduce what neurofeedback is and what you've noticed with nutrition and brain function. Okay, so, uh, so I've... Uh, with neurofeedback, I found that, that certain people react extremely well to it. And uh, for those of you who don't know, neurofeedback is uh, you put sensors on the scalp, uh, usually about 20, 21 sensors, and then you uh, look at the brain waves. And these brain waves can then be quantified by a computer. You basically get numbers to it, and these numbers can be compared to a database and uh, to see if you are in a normative database, are you doing healthy? Are you more towards depressed state? Are you more towards schizophrenia? Are you more towards autism, uh, even dementia? And uh, very quickly realize that if your cells, if your brain cells are not healthy, if your neurons are not healthy, you're not going to get the full benefits of um, getting uh, neurofeedback. And uh, also do something called neuromodulation, where instead of reading signals and playing feedback to the brain, uh, you send a signal uh, to the brain to help reset it, whether it's a magnetic stimulus like TMS or uh, electrical stimulus like uh, transcranial DC stimulation or uh, something that I've late, late, lately been working on, the pons, which sends an electrical signal for your tongue to, to reset your pons and your brain stem. That if you're low in B12, if you diet sucks, if you're not getting good night's sleep, if you're not exercising, it just doesn't stick, and you end up doing 40 to 50 visits where people are optimized. Within 10 visits, you can see a, a great uh, effect. Mm -hmm. So nutrition has a huge impact on how lasting the therapy is right. on the individual. So, so almost everything on the bottom of the matrix, uh, so in functional medicine, we have this matrix where you look at nutrition and hydration and relationships, stress, uh, sleep, um, and, um, uh, and networks. And uh, I got very interested in how flow uh, states, and specifically uh, what uh, Jamie Wheel and Stephen Cotter called no, non ordinary states of consciousness, because you can get into a flow state via um, tribal dancing, mountain biking, uh, skiing, snowboarding, surfing, um, prayer, meditation, uh, lots of drumming, rhythmic sounds. And uh, a lot of this has been discovered thousands and thousands of years ago, and we're rediscovering that technology. And by using that uh, state, you can um, help to, to heal the brain. Uh, some people uh, who has a concussion that won't be able to mountain bike, so I wanted to harness and see, okay, well, can we do, uh, um, in, a, in a lab environment or a clinical environment, can we help people to get into a flow state safely and then see if that helps healing, and, and that seems to be where, where our research is going. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of research now and anecdotal use of microdosing LSD and Correct. mushrooms and things like that. Yeah. Um, does, is that something that you've dabbled in clinically, you know, working with individuals and things like that, CEOs? Has anyone experimented with this personally or, or know or heard of this research that's coming out of uh, Johns Hopkins, I believe, for Correct. depression? Yeah. Um, does that assist individuals in getting into a flow state? So it gets people into um, uh, one of those non ordinary states of consciousness that Jamie Wheel and Stephen Kotler talks about. I'm more interested in see how can we do it uh, the natural way, do it with exercise or with sleep or um, uh, uh, with um, neurofeedback rather than dabbling into medicinal substances. Uh, but uh, I had the fortune of meeting a patient who was one of the, I believe, 20 uh, that did the um, MAPS uh, psychedelics for uh, PTSD. And uh, she was um, uh, very, very, uh, I think she took one or two um, uh, MDMAs and really helped her PTSD. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. to a point. And there was a lot of counseling. So it wasn't just, here's a poll, see you next week. It was a full-on uh, FDA-sponsored uh, trial. She was one of the only Canadians, I believe, that was in the study. Hmm. Uh, and I believe it was really, really helping her. Yeah. So um, as, 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 as Stealing Fire said, there's a lot of CEOs who do that, and they go to Burning Man, um, and it's almost becoming commercial now where uh, it's the cool thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think there's other cool ways to do, uh, yeah, to get into flow states. Uh, one of the things we're working on is to build a flow dojo in Surrey uh, at the Brain Center we're developing. And then we're also having a great play flow dojo in Whistler uh, next year where people can safely get into flow states, whether it's looping swings or uh, there's a surf swing that goes laterally and 360. Uh, there's also a nice gyroscope that's all lit up in rhythmic beats that you can feel the, um, uh, it's called a sub pack, where you can feel this sub uh, woofer uh, frequencies with your heart, and that helps you to put you in a flow state as well. Uh, and then um, doing breathing techniques, so holotropic breathing is where you breathe very, very fast for about 20 or 30 minutes. That can put you into a flow state as well. Uh, and then just sort of what um, people like uh, Dave Asprey called uh, stacking. So if you can find the perfect stack that works for you. So in the Flow Dojo, we'll make sure that people come in, <coughs> excuse me, come in, uh, optimize their state of health, whether they need some help of nutrition or some help of sleep, some physical exercise, maybe there's something wrong with their knee, get the alignment right, and then get them to, to a point where it's, and analyze their flow uh, uh, using brainwaves uh, technology to see uh, what stack that person needs to get into flow state. So stacking different modalities, whether Correct. it's drums, breathing, Correct. things like that. Things okay. like heart rate variability is a great way to get in, uh, helping with sleep, um, something as simple as sleep apnea. Uh, if you have sleep apnea um, and you can be overweight, obese, or skinny fat, uh, if you have sleep apnea, you're not getting a good night's sleep, and that could hinder you from getting into a flow state. Most people in the audience and on, uh, um, on live stream would remember times where you felt your best and you performed your best, and you chased your whole lifetime away trying to get that back. Mm-hmm. And one of the biggest hindrances I found is if you don't get a good eight to eight and a quarter hours of sleep at night, and you don't get those five restorative um, REM cycles, and as you know, you don't clear your brain, then you get a debris, there's more risk for uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, and then you don't get into a flow state. So you chase your whole life trying to get that flow state. And some people, yes, go into psychedelics or alcohol, and I think that it's probably not necessary to go that route if you know the actual stacks to do for yourself. Mm-hmm. So maybe substance abuse is a compensation of lack of getting into flow naturally, potentially. I think s- substance abuse is very complex, but I think that is one of the things that's chasing the eye. You just want to escape. Um, so uh, what they say in Stealing Fire, they, they, they wanted to get away from the words flow state and actually call it ecstasis, is where you, your sense of self diminishes and you become sort of aware of a bigger, uh, a bigger part of the world. And I think that that will help solve these bigger problems that we have. Uh, Stephen Carter talked about his books in Abundance and Bold, about these um, uh, almost million dollar uh, problems, like how are we going to help uh, people with um, uh, food and, and, and solving water? How are we going to solve this carbon pollution, brings, uh, uh, that kind of problem? And we need people in that sort of state of awareness to come up with lateralizing ideas. Sorry, that's someone uh, at the door down there. Okay. Do you have the, the fob? He's on it. Thanks, so Drew. Did we interrupt you, or did you finish yeah. that thought? Okay. Uh, yeah, so just we need basically an army, and, and, and Jamie, we'll call it almost like an army of new soldiers that, that can be the state aware, that can get into this non ordinary state to help people uh, realize these uh, solutions. Mm-hmm. To bigger problems. Yeah. Thinking more holistically. Correct, yeah. yeah. And then not necessarily using substances to get there. I, I, I always like going to uh, events where I don't have to drink. I can really enjoy with people and, and uh, be happy with the music and dance. I think one of the things is the functional medicine conference every year. I'll, and that's mm-hmm. a flow state. You get that flow state during the day where you get group flow, where there's knowledge pouring out, whether it's a fire hydrant from Jeff Bland or something you wanted to know and Mike gives you a nice nudge at, at uh, lunchtime. 
And then you have this wonderful event at night where there's music and song and, and just happiness. And, and, and alcohol may or may not play a part in that. Mm -hmm. And there's the element of flow that, that we haven't really talked about is the risk. And that's Correct. why like action sports potentially, high risk helps Correct. to facilitate flow. And what, what element of risk induces that flow state? So it's usually the risk of death, I think, is the, uh, the biggest concern. Um, but they uh, f figure out that the percentage of risk above the challenge, so it can't be too easy, otherwise you get bored. So what they found is that it just has to be 4% better. Just 4% better, 4% more riskier than you used to. Um, doesn't have to be 100%. Um, so having um, uh, no gravity, so zero gravity is, is one of the biggest things. And then having full gravity as well, so uh, max Gs, and then also uh, a full sort of 360 rotational force as well seems to help people. And then if you can put it in an environment where it's not you doing 360s, double back down and down Whistler, this is you in a gyroscope safely strapped in, maybe blindfolded, maybe you... Um, had a nice artisanal chocolate and maybe a coffee on board, which is a very safe way to get into flow. Yeah. Rather than thinking I might die today. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but I've noticed that, um, so I used to race motocross, and that really was a great way to get into a flow state. And then right. also, like, backcountry skiing. Because it is very risky, there's avalanche, and you exactly. just hit the powder. So it seems like, you know, when, when we see these children doing seemingly silly things, backcountry skiing or motorcycle riding or skateboarding, um, it seems like they're trying to get that hit of flow or ecstasis. Correct. Like talk, this great book, guys, definitely would recommend Stealing Fire, whatever your business or uh, leisurely um, athletic event is. Um, so the element of risk, and then we kind of talked a little bit about some of the benefits that flow offers to the brain, and then we'll, I'd love to finish off with nutrition. So having these flow states, in addition to like the bigger picture in life, like we talked about solving more complex problems more holistically, how does achieving flow affect the brain in terms of repairing from maybe a TBI, depression, anxiety, sleep issues, and much more? Uh, so an interesting, uh, when you're in a flow state, you have access to more information streams. They call it the umwelt, or uh, basically just there's more information, so uh, you can see things faster, you process much quicker. Uh, so that helps the brain to, um, uh, I think, to sort of analyze itself, seeing, oh, shoot, I'm in trouble, and, and reset itself. Uh, a lot of what we find in uh, traumatic brain injury stroke is the uh, increase in noise. So there's this, uh, an increase in uh, signal-to-noise ratio. So if you can reduce the noise part, and that's what flow can do, is really switch off, uh, we call it the Woody Allen part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. That part is like, you're not good enough, you can't do it, you're going to die today, um, all those kind of things. If you can switch that off, your, your, your brain has more processing power. It's basically like unplugging some of the unnecessary elect electricity. Mm -hmm. And so your brain can then work on uh, not having to work on the damaged part of the brain. You can actually work around it. So you can sort of bypass that. Interesting. And that's why I was really interested in flow. One of the big reasons I got into it, uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Kotler um, talked about in his book, uh, The Rise of Superman, which is all about these super athletes, about... Um, he had Lyme disease, and he's a writer for New York Times and big publications, and he had uh, severe uh, 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 cognitive problems, and uh, he was going to end his life. He couldn't make any money. His editors were basically saying, this is not good. You're not, your, your sentences don't make any sense. You're not going to get paid. And he was going to end his life, and some of his friends uh, took him uh, surfing. In LA, and he's like, "This is crazy. Why are you taking me surfing? I want to die." And they put him on a surfboard, and in for a mystical second or two, he had this ecstasy or flow experience. He's like, "What is this?" And he's a very scientific person. He's like, "I don't believe in weird stuff. This is. I need to figure this out." And long story short, they kept him going back. And uh, I met him about two, three years ago, and he's, as far as I can tell, unbelievably well. He was. Flourishing cognitively, uh, and he's, yeah. And he's written. I mean, he's written like four books since then, four or yeah. five books. Very so. detailed books. Very detailed books. So, so I believe flow is one way that we can harness uh, to to heal our brains and to heal our bodies. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, 
So I know anytime any of us have a bad day, you know, things are not going right, it's cloudy and so forth, getting some exercise helps to clear the brain of, of some of that. So um, could it be that just weightlifting, yoga, is that enough? Is that like a microdose of flow potentially or does it need to be that element of risk? There's a, there's a flow cycle. So you have to struggle a bit and that sets off your cortisol on your adrenaline mm-hmm. and then there has to be a release, which is nitric oxide. So I, why I usually recommend people is to have a bit of beet juice or a little bit of nitric oxide on, on board. And then, uh, then you get into a flow cycle where you get the dopamine and the anandamide and endorphins and serotonin flowing. And then very important then is a, um, a, a, a restoration phase. So you need to get your eight hours sleep. That's, uh, that's when I get people to do heart rate variability. Uh, really big believer in flow tanks. Uh, there's some wonderful uh, flow tanks around in the area and uh, get magnesium uh, on board. And uh, then it's much easier to do that in that flow cycle. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, float tank, so that's in the book. I've read this book twice. It's in the sauna, that's why it's all beat up. But um, <laughs> so, so Navy SEALs use the float tanks Correct. to learn faster. So what I've been doing is listening to an audio book in the float tank. So this is, you can talk about what it does, but the sen- sensory deprivation, how it affects the brain. That's a small little tip. So Navy SEALs, normally it takes about six months to learn a foreign language, another language. Uh, Navy SEALs use the sensory deprivation, the flown takes, that Dr. Venture will talk about, uh, to learn a language in 12 weeks. So it can be a great way just to accelerate learning. So if there's a complex topic or an area that you want to excel in or or really master, um, like one of them is kind of a fun book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow about heuristics and, and how we have this you know, really intuitive part of our brain and then kind of the analytical part of our brain. So I, I just want to really, there's a lot of great research in that when it comes to even health and, and eating and all that. Anyway, so you can li- when you're listening to like an audiobook like that, I notice that I can almost like word for word retain what I listen to while in the phone tank. So what is it about that sensory deprivation that helps the brain and the body? So I think it's, it goes down to that signal to noise ratio. If you don't have for those of you who have been on a float tank, you literally don't know where your body ends because uh, the float tanks used to be quite cold in Vancouver and somebody, one of my patients actually complained. So now most of the float tanks are body temperature, so you literally don't feel where your body ends. And uh, because it's very dark inside, it's very, um, as you say, sensory or deprived, uh, your brain does not have any other things to worry about. So I think that's one way that you're getting some of the other systems online. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, using uh, audio, and, and, and uh, Jamie wheels that say the best way to do it is to have um, uh, headphones that are waterproof. Oh, be Much smart. better, um, so to, to almost get like binaural beats going. Mm-hmm. And what they do is they also do heart rate variability before. Now if you can do it during, that's even better, but we don't want to electrocute anybody. Mm-hmm. But that would be the, uh, the, the best way to do it. So do 10, 20 minutes before, so you really hit Get that. right it, and do some allotropic breathing as well, maybe even while you're lying in the, which is just really fast breathing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't remember if it's in this uh, book. It's just one, one page, it's very quick about it. it yeah. talks, they talk about box breathing, which the Navy SEALs do. Mm. Um, you might have mentioned in, this first, in the first chapter, so it's basically you just breathe uh, seven seconds in, hold it, seven seconds out, hold it, uh, you just breathe, and then that you do that for about five ten minutes, that will put you also in a higher state of consciousness. So then you go and do heart rate variability, or you can do it the same. Uh, they've got a great video on the Flow Genome Project uh, website uh, called "The Art of Flow," and you have to really scroll down, which is uh, binaural beats with uh, waves, uh, uh, surfing waves, and that puts you in a state of flow within five minutes. So if you do that, get into flow, then get into a flow tank, have your waterproof. I think that'll be a great way to get on top of all the audiobooks you've missed. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think Don't do great. it while driving. Yes, right, right, right. <laughs> Who's been in the flow tank? Anyone? A few of you? Yeah. Who recommends it to their clients or patients? Quite a few of you. It's awesome. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really good tool. And um, people may not, I mean, if you haven't been exposed to some of this research, you might think it's another... You know, the latest gimmick, whatever, it, like another tanning salon type place, and you may not realize that there's a lot of science, and this has Correct. been studied since like the 1950s, right? That's right, yeah, at the uh, Esalen Institute, mm-hmm. which uh, where, uh, I don't know if you watch, if anyone uh, watched Mad Men or used to watch, that's the last scene, apparently, when he sits, he's looking out over Esalen, which is just outside of San Francisco in Big Sur, 
And um, our first flow camp with Jamie Wheel and Stephen Kotler was at uh, Eslam. So it was sort of a great full circle to get back. Uh, that was really the start of the ultimate human performance or human potential started. Uh, cranial sacral therapy started there. Interesting. At the uh, Upledger Institute at Eslam. Mm-hmm. So there's a great uh, uh, birth, birth story there. That's awesome. So you mentioned that flow camp. You, you told me about that a few years ago. Can anyone go to that, or is it yep. like an invite only? Okay. Um, the, uh, there is sort of a, you want to start with doing the fundamentals, so it's an online course. And then as you go through there, that opens sort of the, then you can go and do a live event. Cool. And uh, there's anything from flow and snow that was out in Utah last year. We had a flow camp in the middle of Powder Mountain. They beautiful, it's just tents, basically like glamping. We had a flow dojo right in the mountains. We were right there when the eclipse was happening. Mm. And uh, um, we had a, a, a rock star of a, a kite surfer, uh, Je- Jesse Richmond, who was able to loop the swing. And this was, this is like 8,000, 9,000 feet uh, above ground. So we were all suffering. Our oxygen saturation was about 92% because we, we brought our oxygen saturation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were all suffering. And this guy just gone and looped three, four times backwards and then forwards and we caught him right as the eclipse happened he was he was basically um, apexing which is quite well and then um, I'm happy to say I'm one of the first uh, black belt flow ninjas out there cool. what does that mean stuff. exactly uh, I'll, I'll have to kill you uh, <laughs> <laughs> top secret stuff alright um, no it means I've done all the courses sure and, uh, so you did sort of you, so there's sort of a black belt or a, a lineage and then uh, you start basically by teaching people about flow and then you go deeper and deeper into it. That's awesome. Yeah, I think this is a great tool for especially practitioners to learn more about it and at least know that that it's there because you mentioned, I mean, a a disease like Lyme disease, it can be very debilitating uh, physically but also neurologically. This is, I mean, getting into a flow state help, you know, Stephen, like you were saying, which is cool. And uh, something like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia as well, which uh, people just don't have the motivation or they have pain when they they go out if Mm -hmm. they can... They still have pain in a gyroscope, but if you put them in there, they, they actually feel better afterwards. And the cool thing about flow, it actually will lag some people six hours, some people two, three days. So you think 10 minutes of flow, you get two or three days of, uh, benefit. of, uh, of benefit, yes. That's awesome. Um, so some of the physiologic benefits, you mentioned uh, signal to noise ratio is improved, Correct. heart rate variability is improved. We, we noticed that, that the ketogenic diet also affects those proxies of health. Correct. You know, so I wonder, it wasn't talked about in the book, and I, maybe that's my bias, trying to, like, hopefully he would say something about ketosis, but it wasn't really mentioned. Anecdotally, you're a big fan of that, uh, the ketogenic right. diet for yeah. cognition. Is there any overlap there that we should know about? Uh, I think a lot of it is, um, has not been studied in this state. One of the reasons I want to bring the but we bring the flow dojo to Surrey and, and Worcester so we can actually study this in a research mm-hmm. environment. We can do double blind, placebo controlled, and see what works. There's a um, ketogenic diet with um, coconut oil work with MCT. Is it better to do it with grass fed beef? Is it better to do it with eggs? Uh, and we can, we can measure your, uh, your levels of ketones in your blood. Um, I think the fact that uh, people with concussions do extremely well and with uh, uh, early onset Alzheimer's or cognitive decline. And there's a lot of studies that shows that at work. Uh, I think it'd be helpful to see what is your APOE4 status before. Because mm-hmm. I think people with an APOE4 uh, double allele probably does better with ketosis. Uh, and they need it probably more uh, than, than the average person. Uh, but as a state of um, uh, almost like delirium where you get in those first three, four days, we've all probably tried it. Uh, probably easier to get into a flow state as well. So, mm-hmm. those, so those are great questions, I think, which I'm happy to, to research. That would be cool. So the clinic, when is that open? So we are um, doing a soft launch in uh, next week, uh, the uh, 13th of October. And we're aiming to open summer 2018. Cool. And we'll have our flow dojo ready in Whistler as well in Surrey. Mm-hmm. And so they don't have to be a patient of yours. People can benefit from this. Yeah, the hope is to have this really uh, for the world. This is, uh, Jamie wants to really restrict the amount of dojos. Um, so we want to keep it high class. Mm-hmm. So we're hoping that it, it will be open to the public, whether we have a, an event-based or a subscription-based. It will probably be the gyms of the future. 
I think we're all tired of the the smell and the yeah. the theory that goes on with gyms. But this will be the new style. Uh, he's incorporated a lot of things like acro yoga, um, which is is really more, more play, adult play and kids play, um, and then also incorporating a lot of kids and seniors. Mm-hmm. So we, as we as we age, as we have got an aging population, we really want to help our seniors as well, yeah. who know they need to exercise, but because of degenerative knees or hips or ways of means they can't get into it. So this is a great way. Uh, our flow dojo in Surrey is actually right next to a senior's home mm-hmm. and close to a high school. So we're quite excited. That's awesome. Uh, okay, let's finish off on some micronutrients. So PQQ, coenzyme Q10 are things that you've noticed increase the amplitude uh, in, in uh, neural feedback. Good memory. Yeah, so let's, let's, I think this is important for people to understand some of the nutrients there. Um, and also ketosis. So let's talk right. about maybe what the, this, the clinical significance uh, for brain cognition and so forth of the amplitude in the neurofeedback and then what you observe with those nutrients. So uh, specifically, and uh, if it depends on what the state of the patient is. So with concussion, your amplitude, your basic, your brain is stunned. The connections have been disrupted. So your brain uh, is really slow. We call that delta waves. So it's really like your brain is asleep. We measure brain waves. But as you know, um, we only see delta waves really when you're asleep. So you should not be making delta waves when you're uh, alert doing a brain map. Uh, So doing uh, something like uh, uh, PQQ or coenzyme Q10 or ubiquinol, very helpful to stimulate the mitochondria, um, which is really why how ketosis work as well, just really purges. The old mitochondria helps your um, uh, mitochondria re re energize uh, vitamin B12, specific hydroxycobalamin and methylcobalamin, uh, very, very helpful to, to get the amplitude up. Um, magnesium is an unbelievably uh, powerful front. I've uh, been playing around more and more with magnesium threonate because we know that mm-hmm. enters the blood brain barrier much better, uh, but still very happy with magnesium glycinate. Uh, really, for um, if you see the brain waves, there's a lot of anxiety, high beta waves, that works really well. Um, Seeing that zinc, uh, incredibly important for the brain, especially for the breath, brain barrier permeability. Um, some wonderful research um, that the T. Scarachian did at the uh, Functional Medicine Conference yeah. about intestinal permeability secondary to concussion. So I think that is a really uh, important avenue to look at. Um, like TBI concussion causes gut permeability. Correct. So, yes. so top down. Wonderful research done, mm. animal models, and they, um, they think they've even got human models now. Unbelievable. Mm. Which would be like uh, a double whammy, right? Because then gut permeability would lead to brain right. dysfunction. So it's like a vicious cycle, hey? And then the cool thing is if you do vagal stimulation, that helps the gut permeability and then it helps the brain permeability. Mm-hmm. So I've got all my patients doing artery permeability using heart math. And then uh, there's some really cool things coming down the line with neuromodulation uh, using uh, vagal stimulation. So where we use direct on the vagus or uh, if you use the pons, which is uh, a way to stimulate the vagus for your tongue. So it's mm-hmm. a little bit more convenient than putting a vagal stimulator in your brain. Right, <laughs> yeah, slightly, hey? Uh, now, is that available retail now at this point? Or? The, we just finished the uh, study. Uh, it was an international study. We are uh, submitting to FDA as we speak. Cool. Uh, and then it's a question of three months, four months, five months. We will hopefully have it uh, uh, available in states um, mm-hmm. and uh, as a therapy. Currently, it's going to be used in a clinic setting, so it'll be a physical therapist that has neurological um, um, background and training. And then uh, we also got Health Canada uh, right after that. So Interesting. That's fantastic. Uh, omega-3 fats, you didn't mention, but is that part of it? No, that is such a ubiquitous thing. Yeah. Uh, all my patients do uh, omega-3. Um, hard to find uh, kids that like the taste, yeah. but luckily there's some awesome options out there. Totally. Um, and just as a side note, you've been tr- experimenting with the monoglyceride form recently Correct. from Zymgen. What have you found right. just anecdotally? Um, a, bit, uh, a bit early to tell still. Yeah. I haven't quite had my uh, full kick at it yet. Yeah, just been like Stay 30 tuned. days or so. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So what's unique about this is it's a monoglyceride. So normally what we have is ethyl ester or triglyceride-based fish oil that need to be emulsified by bile and, and pancreatic enzymes and so forth. So this is just basically pre-digested. So if you've had gallbladder removed or you know, you've had a lifelong of, of uh, 
margarine and, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, this can you know, help to, to get in there a little easier. Um, so last question. So at home devices, you know, a lot of people, we mentioned the heart math device, which right. is great. I think it's like $99, which is awesome. People can meditate on their own, but there's also like apps like the Muse, which is right. the brain sensing headband. Does anyone have the Muse device? So it's uh, made in Toronto. It's a Canadian company, really cool device. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, we, um, so my, my other role is I'm the chief medical officer for Health Tech Connects, and we developed an app called Brain Power that you can download for free on iTunes. And uh, that will give you a score out of a thousand. Uh, it uses evoked potentials um, uh, in, a, in a mathematical equation reading the brain waves. And it'll give you a score so you can say, say right before you take a mono, uh, a mono roll or a, um, a relax max or your bulletproof coffee or your ketose, a ketogenic diet. See what's your brain doing uh, and then do a score afterwards as well. Uh, we did it uh, with our um, Flow Dojo camp. We did one in Worcester with mountain biking. Mm. Almost killed ourselves, but uh, so uh, some of us did it before and after, and there was a dramatic increase. Some of uh, people have been using it for a while. It was the biggest increase in their brain scores. So, wow. so it's a it's a it's a um, uh, uh, basically just consumer based model. So it's something to play around with. Uh, you just need a muse to what's hundred than what two hundred bucks, two hundred fifty yeah. bucks. And then we also have um, something called Brain Vital Sign, which is uh, more clinician-based, which takes uh, about five minutes, but we use uh, a, a really brain cap for that. Gives you a score out of 30. So it's like, a, like you would take your blood pressure in your office, and it's 120 over 80. It's 140 over 90. For somebody who's always been stable, there's a problem. And this Brain Vital Sign uh, device, which we're waiting for FDA and Health Canada as well, mm. it will be available to any clinician um, out there and tell it, oh, how's my brain doing? Mm -hmm. And then if you on a sad uh, diet, a standard American diet, and you switch and you've got a really low score, this might be an impetus to say, okay, well, I'll, I'll try this keto thing or this paleo thing for a while and see if it makes a difference. And if it does, hey, you've got some objective evidence there. Mm -hmm. but there may be something going on. Exactly. Um, so your device or your app uh, uses the Muse Data? Yeah, currently uses okay. the Muse. It's platform uh, independent. Uh, currently, the best device that we can use is Muse, and mm -hmm. we are working on something quite cool, which are like brain strips. So instead of putting the Muse on, it will be strips behind your ears or on your forehead. Awesome. Good quality brain data, and the cool thing is you can swim with it. You can go mountain biking, go do double black diamond. You can do motocross. You can wear it on a helmet, mm -hmm. and you can see okay, how did your brain do, and what moment did you get stuck, mm -hmm. and what can we do around it. That's awesome. uh, getting out of it, unstuck. Yeah. yeah. Um, so everyone listening or watching or here has a brain that they're interested in preserving, so. and optimizing, you know, the function of that. So do you recommend like once a year as every adult? Because we're all susceptible to this. We can trip and fall, you know, crash skiing, get hit by a car or whatever. Uh, doing a, a vital signs or some sort of mapping just to get our baseline to see if we do, if our, we're, you know, regressing cognitively? Great. So uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Dale Bredesen, uh, calls it uh, the cognoscopy at age 45. So just like you have to have your colonoscopy at 40 or 50, depending where you are in the world, you should really have a cognoscopy, so a brain vital sign assessment at least at 45. So you can see, what is my risk? And uh, he does a whole panel of nutrients. Uh, he does volumetric MRI. Uh, he uses... Um, uh, uh, genetic studies to see, okay, what is your risk? And he's been, he's been shown uh, with quite a few publications so far that um, you can reverse uh, cognitive decline, but you have to start soon. You can't wait until you're 80 and say, okay, now I'm going to change my diet. Now I'm going to try this CrossFit thing. Mm -hmm. You can't start it at 80. You have to start young. Really? Yeah, that's awesome. And every year? The cognoscopy. Yeah, I think uh, some people, uh, it's almost like a stress is for the heart. If you have a high risk, you probably want to do it every year. Mm -hmm. uh, some people probably can do it every five years. Okay. You see, And most of us know something is wrong. Uh, I had a patient yesterday at 60 said, oh, it's just old age. I can't remember my this and this and that. And, and he's a salesman. I uh, can't remember people's names. I said, okay, this is serious. I mean, I've got people while in the 80s, 90s, 100s, so fluent memory. This mm -hmm. is not aging. If you're starting to have that, that is, it might not be a sign of dementia, but it might be a sign. It's definitely a sign something's going on. Mm -hmm. And it's cool to check out, okay, is it because your diet, it's because you exercise, you're not sleeping well, is it your B12, is it your magnesium, right. is it your uh, 
uh, glutathione levels are low. I mean, this is the cool thing about functional medicine. There's so many ways you can go down. Mm -hmm. And personalize it. it. And personalize it, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. This was, this was really great. Do, we, do you guys have any questions here? I mean, the point of this is to kind of share you know, stories and, and, and all that. And then I'm going to look at the live stream here. But any questions for Dr. Venter on some of the things we've, we've been talking about? Yeah. Have you tried uh, taking nootropics on a ketogenic diet? And have you even looked into to see how that's affecting you or people you work with? Not currently. I uh, grew up in South Africa, so we um, we used a lot of the nootropics there for uh, people with uh, concussion and stroke. Uh, we did the IV version; worked really well. When I came to Canada, it wasn't available. You have to get it through. So, not currently. There's a lot of companies that call themselves nootropics. I think the cool thing is I wanted an objective evidence to say, and I think we're now getting to a point where, with using brain vital signs, you can use brain power. Say, okay, well, is this really working for my brain or is it just because I'm feeling better? Because I think there's a lot of, um, number one, most of these things are quite expensive. Mm -hmm. And some of them are definitely in the gray area of harm, but it might not be so safe for your liver or your uh, renal function. So. Can you just follow up? Oh, on? yeah. Yeah, so I've tried a lot of nootropics, done a lot of experiments with them, and I found that being on a ketogenic diet, I feel the effects of nootropics a lot more. Right. So I just, I, that's what I was curious about. Yeah, I, if I, to yeah, to to I use uh, vitamin B12 as a as a nootropic uh, right. for patients and myself, and certainly those ones who are on, are on ketosis or ketogenic, <coughs> it makes a huge difference. So the mitochondria is in better uh, a, a, a better state to be, I think, susceptible to to that. So so it makes sense. Yeah. For your B12, is that oral or intravenous? I I've played around with. Um, with oral, I, I'm not, and I've tried the best of the best liposomal. Um, I'm not, if somebody is in my office because they, they're not well for their brain, I go to IM. Uh, I do uh, Myers cocktails for people. I, it's quite laborious to get them once a week. Uh, I teach people to do it IM themselves, or you can do sub-Q. And I use methylcobalamin uh, or uh, uh, hydroxycobalamin. So it, and it works really, really well. And uh, some people get away with Sublingual, I would say most people, like 90%, I just get them to inject themselves. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, weekly? Yeah, like um, I start off, depends. Uh, so I do something that's really cool. Um, uh, use a 256 hertz tuning fork. Mm. And then you check your vibration, or you check your patient's vibration. And normally it should be about 30 seconds that you would feel peripheral vibration. And if you're losing that, you've got a peripheral neuropathy. And I'm surprised how many people, like five seconds, it's gone. Mm. And you can buy this at any uh, Long & McQuaid or uh, music store. And um, uh, if somebody has neuropathy signs and have cognitive signs and they've tired and that, I would get them injections once a week. Mm -hmm. I usually get a level, either a, a B12 or a, a serum of methylmalonic acid, which is really hard to get in Canada. You guys in the States, it's much easier. Um, but we can get that before, and then I do it weekly uh, for about four weeks, and then I test them, and I usually do it monthly. Um, I've had people that to do it every day in the beginning mm -hmm. just to get them to levels. In France, I know they do uh, 10 days, 10 days uh, at a time, one, one, one day, 10 10 days in a row, and then once a month. So I've always remembered that from uh, medical school. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways. And B12 is extremely safe. Uh, it's very, very rare that you would have any um, problems, as long as you don't use cyanocobalamin, which, as the name implies, there's a cyanide molecule in there somewhere. So Yeah, it's crazy. That's Probably better prenatals and children's multiple is insane. Yeah, but that's pretty crazy. <laughs> Hopefully uh, we can get it out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question for you if no one else does, but I think, did you have? Yeah, just a be a long one, but uh, you mentioned TMS therapy for depression. Um, what is your take on ketogenic diets and maybe exogenous ketone supplementation in terms of reducing anxiety and bipolar light symptoms? Yeah, so now, now you bring the question is, uh, and really what it is depends what is the cause for the depression. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the cause for the depression could be, especially in Vancouver, is low vitamin D. So you can probably throw all the TMS you want and all the ketosis. Just get the people, the person's t uh, vitamin D up. Uh, if, it's, if we imply that all those nutrients are right, I think um, something like ketosis is very, very helpful. Uh, I've had quite a few patients who did very well with that. 
Uh, TMS, if you look at the current, uh, and don't quote me on this, but you're only looking at about 30%. It's not very high. It's very specific protocols. If you deviate from the protocols, you get much better success. So what I do with neurofeedback and with brain mapping, you can see which part of the brain is different. And you can then focus your TMS therapy or transcranial DC stimulation uh, or whatever other stimulation device you have. There's some interesting things going on with transcranial ultrasound. Um, and if you do that in a medical setting, at the right place, right time, and the cells are optimized, I think you get a much better thing. So. Well, this is the reason I'm asking because a lot of my clients do have bipolar or even BPD-like symptoms. And yeah. they put them on ketogenic diets and with these agonist ketones and over the course of six months, even shorter days. You get much better, yeah. But in terms of crisis, though, that's what I'm thinking. Correct. Yeah. Like so the uh, brain mapping would be beneficial. Yeah, so it, it just helps you to see what's going on, and uh, something that uh, uh, that I that is maybe a big tip uh, for those of you who don't use it uh, already is lithium orotate, which is not currently available as a supplement in Canada, but you can get it as a prescription. It can be compounded. Oh, you so, yeah. In Canada. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can get it. Uh, but very good for, for irritability, very good for bipolar, very good for aggression, uh, and very good for suicidal. And, and we're talking 30 milligrams. Uh, wonderful article at uh, actually the, uh, the recent um, uh, Functional Medicine Conference. Unfortunately, I don't think it was archived, mm -hmm. which is too bad. James Greenblatt, maybe? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One, mm -hmm. you, did you interview him? Yeah, he's really, yeah he yeah. opened okay. uh, everyone's yeah. eyes, I think, to, to lithium more tape, Correct. which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, so that's something that I would I primarily put in. But higher dosages in that acute kind of crisis? Like yeah, I think de depending on kidney function and thyroid and that, if you can monitor that. But yeah, definitely wonderful successes of that. So on top of that, so so you really have to meet and personalize where the client or the patient is at that time. Yeah. Uh, I've had good success as well with uh, higher doses of mm. Okay. Yeah. as for people who are like mania or psychotic things. Yeah, I found with uh, neurofeedback as well, I've got quite a few successful clients who've had uh, neurofeedback. If you balance the two halves of the brain, it seems to work quite well. And then just getting their sleep. They, they need to sleep. And so whether it's magnesium or and Jamaican dog. What do you think of uh, Epsom salt baths? Like yeah, I, uh, I love the float tanks because it's 900 pa pounds of, of magnesium compared to two cups. But yes, absolutely love magnesium Epsom salts. Yeah. What's your take on getting kids that they can use it in terms of supplementation? Really choice? Uh, I give them the liquid. There's a couple of companies uh, that's available locally that you can get uh, liquid. So yes, especially if they're constipated and they don't eat their greens. Yeah, okay. yeah, wonderful. Love magnesium. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Go for it. Is there less variance in requirements in sleep requirements than we maybe imagine that? so much variance in people's needs. But you, you seem quite specific about eight, eight and a quarter hours. Uh, yes. You know, all of us know people who say, I'm fine with five hours. And I, I, and, I, and I, I can call a few people out at podcasts, but uh, there are people who say, oh, I can sleep stack and I can, I can get away with four hours. Uh, if you watch these people over time, they don't look so healthy. Um, they don't act so healthy. And if you look at this, the, the current sleep mechanics, your brain need to... Um, go through those five cycles to basically purge itself. I, I tell people it's like flushing the toilet. If you're not flushing your brain five times a night, you're only flushing it once or twice, stuff has to go somewhere, and you're not going to notice it right away. It's going to be years down the road. It's like smoking. People say, oh, I smoked 20 years ago, and I just two packs, and I all stop. I'm all healthy now. You still had major risk for cancer, and I would not stop screening. So, so I think there are people get away with that. Uh, if you look at um, uh, 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 things like the brain vital signs we're using, uh, use the brain power score. You can just use a tool and see what, what you can do. I mean, there's obvious exceptions. Uh, people can get away with it, and it depends how young you are. Uh, I think at 18, I mean, I was med school, I was in the army. I mean, some days you didn't sleep for three days, and I think I functioned okay. Can I do it now? Even with all the stacking and, and all that, I'd be severely worried if I was a patient seeing myself. Mm -hmm. on that stage. But you can get away with it. But talk to me in 20 years. <laughs> yeah. 
I think you're referring to that that book that came out. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, different um, personality types: the bear and the wolf. Yes, uh, that's remind right. me of the guy. In, Is it in, Michael Brews? Yeah, in yeah. Southern California. Yeah. So we t- did talk about that. And um, if you look at that from like the teleological evolutionary perspective, like in, in tribal er- era. Um, the impetus for having different sleep cycles and different people that would stay up late versus early birds and all that was to help protect you know communities yeah. of people so that at some point in time and a, a damn party is doing some research on this with someone at university of toronto i think or or mcmaster anyhow that um there's natural ebb and flow in everyone's sleep cycle uh, just a little bit from that perspective so that if you're in a village and there's intruders the probability of someone being up at one point is highest so I, I saw it uh, personally with uh, my wife where um, she was uh, a reasonably light sleeper before kids and became a very, very deep sleeper uh, during, and, and I became the light sleeper. So I think it's part of it that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a very open thinker, a lateral thinker, so I don't believe in boxes. I think once people say black and white and there's no gray, I think you get in trouble. Yeah. Uh, I think there's there's lots of mixes, and I like said that there are, there are clearly people who can do that, who just function on little sleep, and they can do. Um, I mean, the, the classic example is uh, Einstein and Edison, where he, they did power naps. They so slept on the couch and they had what keys and a ladle, and it will drop, and that's how they became all these inventions. And I think they probably went into flow states because they were so exhausted. Mm-hmm. That they they kind of but. Then if you look at the, uh, the analysis of uh, Einstein's brain, because they were able to steal a part of his brain, and then looked at the connections, and he had much less connections. He actually had atrophy of his brain. Now, you would never have known that if you met him, but there was some. So that's why you see there's, there's, there's stuff would be what looks OK. And if you start going deeper, it's like, oh, wait a minute. There's, there's other stuff on the go here. Yeah. Interesting. Um, one thing that I found with sleep, any, anyone want to jump in and anecdotally on this, um, going in the sauna before bed seems to really help promote deep sleep. And using the Aura Ring, I don't know if anyone has that, but it does attract sleep architecture. So the ketogenic diet I've noticed does improve sleep architecture, uh, deep sleep and REM sleep, and then also going in the sauna before bed. So you doing an infrared sauna, right? Yeah. yeah. So the, and that's probably mitochondrial frequency, so that gives you... Uh, one thing I saw a lot of in chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia patients if you don't have energy, you're not going to sleep. And that's typical of the patients told me. They're wired and they're tired. They can't sleep. So if you haven't slept for three days, how can you not fall asleep? And it's because they don't have the mitochondrial energy there. So, mm-hmm. And for those, that's where the ketosis really helps. I think it really purges um, uh, the, um, uh, the mitochondria and really get them online. And just an alternative fuel source. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Very helpful. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess I had one more question on uh, on the gut and SIBO. So we see this so commonly where people say, well, you know, I did the antibiotic protocol, the SIBO elimination diet, uh, elemental diet, and so forth, and it came back. I still can't have onions. I can't have everything. So if there is this trauma-induced change in the permeability and maybe the motility of the gut, could SIBO really be kind of a brain disorder? Have you kind of thought about that? Yeah, I think that um, we see that quite a bit in... Um uh, in concussion patients, they, they, a lot of them have got uh, uh, like bloating, gut symptoms. Um, they, uh, at least 20% of um, concussed patients also have um, uh, either a pituitary gland they, they, they function. So you have to sort of go through that, make sure there's no fire dysfunction. But yeah, I think this whole vagal nerve dysfunction is untapped. We mm-hmm. need to really look into that. Yeah, very interesting. Dr. Brenter, thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. If folks want to connect with you, if they're watching the feed right now, where can they do that? Probably easiest to talk to you for now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, the comment, I'll, I'll update the uh, YouTube description if people are still watching right now. All right. So we'll do a little transition here. Uh, bring the. We'll